welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, am I filling in the potholes on the A38? I am not. I am shooting driven wild boar in Germany. I'm in London talking to Rob Gray of the Countryside Alliance about shooting and its prospects in Parliament. First, the optics company Zeiss invited a number of journalists to its headquarters in Wetzlar. So you've got the cream of the world shooting journalists gathering in Germany. Gentlemen, the egos have landed. Which is the best hunting nation is what we all want to know. Let's meet the teams. The Italians, shifty and feckless. The Scandinavians, unhealthy obsession with axes. The Germans, their sense of humour is no laughing matter. And the British, brave, super, noble. First up, we're off to the wild boar cinema to practice shooting real rifles at video effect animals. Here's one of the Brits, shooting sports magazine editor Pete Moore, to explain. It's a real-time experience with real-time targets. For instance, driven boar, which is exciting as we know, and the Brits are picking up on it big time. Therefore, you have a real target running in a realistic manner. You can track it, you can shoot it, you can see where the bullet flies. You can then learn very quickly. A day on the range, you could take a novice, I would say, out to a driven hunt and he'd accomplish himself very well indeed. Here you have real animals filmed in real situations, going up and down, coming towards you, quartering, bum on, face on, and you've got to account for that with your shooting. The Italians are practicing at the same time as us. Sporting rifle editor Peter Carr and well-known shooting writer Mike Yardley discuss their form. Well, looking at the competition, I think we're going to win hands down, Charlie. Next, we're off to a more traditional range. So we've come to the range to test our skills and I reckon I've got a secret weapon. Check it's clear. This, it's a thermal imaging scope. I'll never miss, never will. With this rifle scope, you can see wildlife when it is hidden behind cover. Even this beater. Don't worry, we filmed this bit away from the range. The ghostly figure you see walking upside down comes from the reflection on our camera lens. Now it's back to the range to see how I do. Not so good. I may be letting the side down. Here's what one of the Zeiss staff thinks of our chances. Yeah, the Italians, they shoot very, very good, so uh, you have to, to shoot a bit better than they uh, shoot. Now, have you seen the Scandinavians this morning already? Yeah, yeah, they shoot very, very good, so um, Didn't really hear that. this is hard to, to achieve. <laughs> Did not want you to say that, that's bad. Okay, la last one's the Germans. You're, you're German, so do the Germans shoot straight? Yeah, they shoot, shoot straight and accurate like Germans shoot. So the ones we really need to worry about are the Scandinavians. Let's remind ourselves what they look like. End of day one and it's back on the bus and home for an early night. The big day is coming up tomorrow. Well, let's leave the shooting ranges for a moment and go and visit London, where Robert Gray of the Countryside Alliance has this view on the prospects for shooting in Parliament. There is a move afoot in Parliament to criminalise some of the most law-abiding people in the country, sports shooters. Following the mass shootings in Cumbria, the Home Affairs Committee uh, decided to launch an inquiry into licensed firearms in this country and to investigate whether anything could have been done to prevent the terrible events in Cumbria. The committee have now produced their report and there's several recommendations which we have serious concerns about. The government isn't obliged to accept uh, any committee's recommendations, but they may, be, uh, they may feel the need to be seen to be doing things, which of course is uh, often a disaster. Some of the main things we're concerned about, there is a recommendation to place shotguns under Section 1, which means that for every shotgun that you may own, you might need a good reason to, uh, well, to own it. You might, they might ask you questions about where you're going to shoot, what you're going to shoot, you might need variations. And there are over one million shotguns in this country and 200 million cartridges fired every year. I mean, it will be a nightmare for the police and it will be a nightmare for the law-abiding shooter community. And it's just plain wrong. 
The Home Affairs Committee is putting British jobs at risk. You would first of all need a good reason to have that shotgun certificate, but then you would need a good reason to own each and every shotgun, which of course is a, a serious step up. You then, if you wanted to change the shotgun, perhaps you might need uh, variations. Also, you would, you would probably have to state where you plan to use that shotgun. And uh, for many people who shoot, uh, they may not know where they're going to be shooting in the, the forthcoming shooting season. Uh, and also there may be restrictions on what uh, species you might be able to shoot. So it, is an, it would be an absolute disaster for the shooting community and the gun trade if this were to happen. The sport of shooting teaches young people firearm safety, responsibility and good citizenship. Unfortunately, the Home Affairs Committee has the young in its sights too. What we strongly object to is penalising young shooters who have nothing to do with uh, the likes of Derek Bird and uh, anything else that might have happened. We think that shooting teaches young people responsibility, citizenship and offers them a great start in life. And it also offers great opportunities to bond, often in the countryside and at shooting clubs, with members of their family and their friends under supervision. Another recommendation from the committee is that police should ask questions about shooters' suitability to own firearms, not just to partners, but to ex-partners. One thing about the proposal to consult domestic partners is that if it weren't so serious, it would be laughable. Um, we all have uh, the occasional uh, domestic argument with our, uh, with our wives or partners, but the fact of the matter is it's one thing to have an argument over who's doing the washing up, but it's quite another thing to get the police involved when we're discussing shotgun and firearm certificates. The Home Affairs Committee have tried to look at this rationally. They haven't looked at the firearms licensing for 10 years, so they're perfectly entitled to look at it. But what they must not do, and what we'll be urging the government not to do, is to penalise the law-abiding shooting community at the expense of doing nothing to solve gun crime. Shooters value their sport as an important leisure activity. The Home Affairs Committee sees it as a money-making opportunity. One of the other recommendations in, in, the, in the report is to, to increase fees. Um, and again, uh, we're trying to see how this links back with uh, the events of the last 12 months. If the whole point of fees and the certification process is to do with public safety, then we believe that law-abiding shooters should be trusted and they should pay a fee, but also a certain part of the fee should be met from the public purse if it's all about public safety. Shooters are nervous that these proposals, were they to become law, would destroy their sport. A sport that's brought a bag full of medals at recent Olympic and Commonwealth Games. A government that takes this committee report to white paper stage risks losing the support of 750,000 shotgun and firearms licence holders and up to 3 million airgun owners. Everybody agrees there are about 34 different pieces of legislation uh, regarding firearms and almost all of them have been enacted for, you know, in re reacting to some sort of dreadful situation. Nobody has sat down calmly and consolidated all the legislation, which we would support. But any simplification of firearms laws must not mean restrictions. The Prime Minister said, you know, you cannot legislate for a switch flicking in someone's head. And that is exactly uh, the sort of level-headed um, response we are looking for when the government respond to the Home Affairs Committees. Now, we're back in Germany, where competition between the nations is really hotting up. And today's the day we're going boar hunting. The day of the driven hunt dawns awfully early. This is not like a British shoot where guns assemble, are reminded not to shoot each other and there are a couple of old gits with deaf Labradors who promise to pick up the dead birds. This is Germany. We have three separate briefings on what we can and cannot shoot, including a PowerPoint presentation. We know there is plenty to shoot here. We just have to remember, mouflon, but only if their horns don't curl further than their ears. Red stags, but only if their antlers have two atop or fewer. So this fellow is off the menu. No big sow boar, but only roe does, no bucks. The visible boar damage shows how many of these creatures are in this 3,000 acre forestry block. Each drive is about two hours long and you are alone on your stand with the sounds of the forest around you. You can't move. The Germans told us that, for safety reasons, we could not even leave our stand to answer a call of nature. Then they laughed. See, for us, a simple function. For them, the basis of an entire culture.
From time to time, dogs would go past. And then, I saw boar. Did you miss it? Let's enhance the image and slow it down. How am I supposed to shoot that? The next one is harder. Not only am I meant to shoot it, I first have to identify it as a roe doe and not a roe buck. At lunchtime we are collected and I discover that my next door neighbour has had luck. He is a German and this is a barbecue sized pig. Next door but one is a Scandinavian. I ask him how he has done. I saw uh, one great mufflon. Uh, four or five years maybe. Big one. Yes, yeah, a really big one. Danilo Liboi, editor of Cacciari Appala magazine, proves that the Italians have been doing as well as the Norwegians. So I, I shoot with the uh, Blazer R93 in uh, 300 Winchester Manium. And I shoot a lamb of, uh, of mufflon. There was, there was a female and, uh, and lamb. The, I shoot the lamb and the female stop, but I don't shoot the female because... Um, because uh, because it was a, a, a very big female and a nice one, so I prefer to uh, live in the wood. And after I see two, three, three, four ram, very good ram. And uh, the other Italian uh, didn't didn't shoot. So I think we we're, we're about equal. Italy and Britain at the moment is about equal. I think the the Scandinavians are just doing better than us, and I think the Germans are on top. The 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 German the the organization or the hunter? The shooters, the hunters. But I think that <laughs> I think that uh, uh, for the the tradition the, the tradition of of Kugel Kugel Jäger, sure the German I think is the top like the Austrian people but uh, the north of Italy uh, is not second to anybody <laughs> and it's not second to Germany or the South Tyrol or uh, and all the north of Italy. Our tradition for the uh, the, the, the Kugel Jäger, uh, the, the big game is uh, is the same of the Austria, the same of the Germany. I think uh, yeah. not now the gap is not so so so, so high. Now we are we, we are alive. <laughs> and you notice there's a big uh, mufflon. This is a very, very big mufflon. <laughs> yeah, this is a big 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 mufflon. Uh, you shoot that one? No, no, I think I don't think so. <laughs> there are quite a few wild animal sculptures here. There are quite a few wild animal sculptures here, some of them weirder than others. Now I take the afternoon off to join the wounded boar follow-up team. On this hunt they put a dog in for every shot fired. With 200 shots fired today, that means 200 separate sniffs. And each sniff covers a 300 metre radius from the point where the shooter says the animal was when he or she hit or missed it. Occasionally there is a confirmed wounded animal to follow up. My new friend Reiner and his Hanoverian hound Asper are on the scent of a wild boar. He's my friend because he's the one with the gun which, if that boar is still alive, we're going to need. Reiner fits Asper with a GPS tracking collar and a long leash. The leash allows Asper lots of room to manoeuvre while her head is down. When her head goes up, Rhino lets her off the leash and a combination of her barking and the GPS collar leads him to where she has found the boar. It is exhausting work, a half-mile dash through thick scrub and woodland while Asper's nose is down, then a last-minute sprint. Reiner makes short work of the Gralic and then drags the carcass up to a forestry track for collection. The sun is going down and it is the end of the driven day. How did the Brits get on? Well, I saw a lot of game and yeah, the, the highlight of it was seeing a royal stag. I mean, I love to see a royal stag, we all do, and it's a moment you always remember. Quite a lot of game was shot. On my first, first stand I could have shot a row doe, I decided I wouldn't. Um, quite interesting at this time of year, of course, you've got to be careful to distinguish between the does and the bucks because the antlers have fallen. Um, but um, I made the choice, no, didn't want to shoot her. 
Now, look, 120 animals were shot yesterday, and, and other people were being perhaps less discriminating than you. <laughs> Everything that was shot was, was completely legal and, and in season, of course. But is there a question? Is there a question about sport and the definition of sport here? I think there is, but I think it's a personal thing. I had the chance to shoot a hind later as well, and I passed up on that. I did shoot a boar, which was the main purpose of the exercise for me. Remember, though, all of this stuff is being tagged and is going straight into the food chain here. So it, it's not just a question of sport, it's also a question of harvesting the meat. But I make my own sporting decisions, each of us has to decide ethically what we're happy with, and so I went with boar. Not getting soft, are you? No, no, I'm not getting soft. <laughs> or maybe just a little bit. <laughs> The Scandinavians had a good half. I shot two. Two there. Yeah. One stag, one 11 pointer, and one female. So you're very happy. Yeah, excellent. Okay, well, we're going to see how the Italians did. It's not easy. No, but uh, the Mayora Mayora, they are eating everything, so they probably shot small birds. <laughs> not true. Here is one Italian with a good bag. Confusingly, he's speaking German. Wildschwein und Muffel. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. The trend here, of course, or the tradition here, is that you're shooting often at running game. Personally, I'm not really happy shooting at running deer. I'll shoot a boar moving, but I like to shoot a deer standing still so I can make absolutely sure of what's going to happen. Um, you can't really shoot boar like that, so I accept that and I do shoot running boar, and you should practice for it. If you've got the chance to shoot on a running boar range at home, do it. At the very least, make sure your gun is zeroed before you come. That really is important. But it's a different way of doing things, and it's a great tradition. And I think one thing that they do have to teach us is the great respect they show and the tradition that they show for the game. It's all laid out in the square, the, the hunting horns blow, and it is a great moment, you know, the sort of hairs on the back of your neck come up, and it's a great tradition. It's different to ours, but it's a very good tradition, and also, I think we were all stunned. I mean, I know it's, um, it's something we say in jest about the Germans, about precision and organization, but it probably was the best organized shoot I've ever been on. It was an extraordinary piece of organization. I think something over 100 beasts were shot in total, and we all had our own stands. There was a tremendous amount of organization about getting people to the right stand at the right time, things changing over on the dot, and it all went exactly according to plan. And the guy who was the hunt master, nevertheless, was a really nice, laid-back guy. People couldn't have been more friendly. It was a great experience. So who is the king of the forest? Well, we go to the dungeons of a nearby castle to find out that one. And the winner is... The Viking. Well, a deserved King of the Forest title for the Scandinavian Stöller there. And it is time for us to head back to Blyse. We're back next week. This has been Field Sports Britain from Germany. Germany.